Good morning, church. Um, yeah, when I found out that when they were coming, I just literally missed them by like seven, eight days. I was kind of bummed about that. Um, Crossway, like Eli said, is my home church, um, but I'm excited for the work that they're coming here to do. Um, it's a great bunch of people who've been praying over this, training over this back in Wisconsin, and now they're going to be here. They're going to be the hands and feet to actually carry this out, so I'm super excited for that. Um, and like I said, it's, it's a great privilege to be here with you sharing God's word, and, and if you have your Bibles, I'm going to have you, um, I'm going to ask you to turn to Psalm chapter 19, Psalm chapter 19, and we're going to be reading the entire chapter, Psalm chapter 19. As you turn to Psalm chapter 19, um, I'm going to read, and I ask you to follow along with me. This is the word of the Lord. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies above proclaim his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and the words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs his course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from his seat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgressions. Let the word of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we turn to your word, Lord, God, we ask that you would open our hearts to these truths, Lord. God, that you would make these truths the desire of our heart, Lord. I pray that you open our minds to be able to understand what it is that you have for us. God, our desire, the desires of our lives is to worship you, Lord, to glorify you, and we recognize that we need your help. So as we turn into your word, we ask for your help right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Purpose and meaning are foundational to our understanding of who we are and what role we play in this big world that we live in. It is in understanding our purpose and meaning that we discover that there's joy, that there's strength, that there's fulfillment and even hope, and that, it really, and that our lives really do matter, and that there is actually something worth living for and something worth doing. And so a few weeks ago, I actually did a Google search just to see what are some of the questions that people are asking that relate to life and purpose. And, and unsurprisingly, in the top five questions were the questions of what is, what is the meaning of life and, and who am I? Questions that deal with purpose and meaning. You see, these are important questions because these are questions that we all need defining because without purpose and meaning, we feel lost, we feel hopeless, we feel unsure of ourselves. And so as we begin to think about purpose and meaning, there are a couple of questions that we need to be asking ourselves. Some of these questions are, where do I find purpose? Is it something that I find within myself? Is it something that is given to me by someone else? Or or is it found maybe in the things that I do? You see, some of us find purpose and meaning in jobs or in titles. Some of us in taking care of our families. Some of us in wealth and pleasure. Others in in eating and eating healthy and working out. And there are many other countless ways in which people find purpose and meaning for their lives Yet we find that all of these are temporary and circumstantial. I mean, think about it. What happens when you lose your job 
or what happens when someone in your family dies or, or you or a loved one is diagnosed with cancer. What, what happens when money can no longer buy happiness or there's an accident that changes your life forever. You see, none of these things can provide everlasting purpose and meaning for our lives. And so we must look somewhere else for this. One of the things that I really enjoy doing in my, in my time off or is, is looking for furniture that has been abandoned, that has been destroyed, and actually repurposing it. I like to, I like to do, uh, repurpose it to what it was originally done or give it a new purpose. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll take the furniture and I'll break it up. And then I'll build it up as something brand new. I'll give it a new design, a new purpose. And as its creator, I get to determine what purpose that new furniture or that new piece of equipment is going to fulfill. And so as we think about purpose and as we think about where do we gain our purpose, we need to turn to God, the creator, who designed us with a specific purpose in mind. We don't need to look at culture or the world to tell us what our purpose is. Some of you may be familiar with the Westminster Shorter Catechism. It asks this question. It asks, what is the chief end of man? Or another way of asking this is, what is the main purpose of mankind? And it answers it in this way. It says, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. You see, that speaks to purpose and meaning, but it also speaks to time. It, it, it tells us that we were created to glorify God. It tells us that we were made to enjoy God. And then it tells us for how long? Forever. This is not temporary. It's not fleeting. It's not circumstantial. It's eternal. And it is based on our creator's design for us, what we were actually created for. You see, it is by enjoying and delighting in God that we are able to glorify God and thus fulfill the purpose which we, which we were created for. The, the Westminster Shorter Catechism goes on to ask this question. What rule has God given to us to direct us how we may glorify him? What rule has God given to direct us how we may glorify? And it answers it in this way. The word of God, which is contained in the scriptures, in the Old and New Testament, is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him. You see, it is in the scriptures where we're able to find who and what we were created for. And it is only through the scriptures where we receive instructions on how we're actually to fulfill that purpose. It is the scriptures that answers the questions that are intrinsic and fundamental to who we are. And so we see that we weren't just created for something or something for something that is here today and gone tomorrow. But we were created for someone who is eternal and has designed us, again, with eternal purpose. And this is what I like about Psalm 19. It actually helps us understand this. It helps us understand that the great purpose of all of God's creation, including mankind, each and every one of us, is, is to glorify God. And it does this in three ways. First, it shows that creation glorifies God. Second, it shows how the scriptures are essential to our lives in order for us to be able to fulfill the purpose which we were created for. And third, it shows us a heart of someone who's been affected by scripture as they seek to glorify God according to his word. And so today our passage can actually be split up into three sections, all of them speaking to one simple truth, and that is that glorifying God is the purpose, design, and even delight of all of God's creation. To reject that truth and to find purpose and meaning in anything other than God is to miss the real purpose, the joyful, eternal purpose for which we were created. And so as we turn to section one, we see creation declaring the glory of God. Creation declares the glory of God. Look with me at verses 1 through 6. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and in their words to the ends of the world. In them, 
He has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. Here we see the heavens declaring and proclaiming the greatness of his creator, the glories of God. But the question is, what are they saying and how are they declaring God's glory? As I was reading and meditating through Psalm 19 a few weeks ago, I was actually thinking about the skies and the heavens and, and how big and vast they were. And I, and I was thinking about how many stars there are in the skies. I remember hearing about how the Milky Way is just one galaxy out of billions of galaxies in our universe. And I read an article on NASA's website that said this. It said that in the mid-1990s, there was an estimate that the observable universe contained about 200 billion galaxies. But it went on to say that further research showed that that estimate was at least 10 times too small. And then it went on to say astronomers estimate that the universe could contain up to one septillion stars. I've never heard of that number before. <laughs> that, I mean, that's a one followed by 24 zeros. Our Milky Way alone contains, contains more than 100 billion stars, including the sun. I mean, those numbers begin to boggle the mind. But here is something that's even more astonishing than that. L listen to what Psalm 147 verse 4 says. It says, He, referring to God, determines the number of stars. He gives to them their names. Think about that. Every single star out there is known by God. I love this part. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 5, God says to Abraham, look up to the heavens and number the stars. And then he says, if you're able to number them. I mean, let's assume, let's assume that there are one septillion stars. There's a septillion stars. How long do you think it would take you to actually number them stars? It's a crazy number. But you see, here's my point with this. Whereas to this day, we're still unable to number the stars, God knows the exact number that they're out there and that he knows them by name. The psalmist is saying God knows each and every star personally and individually. Now, think about that for a second. Think about what that says about God and how he relates to his creation. Think about how God relates to you and to me if he knows all the details of the stars. Look with me again at verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. As we study the heavens, we begin to learn how complex this world actually is. And, and yet, as complex and grand as this world actually is, there's no denying that there's a sense of order and logic in all of creation, which again points to an even greater creator, who in full wisdom and knowledge laid down the foundations of the world and created the vastness of the skies and everything therein. Listen to what Genesis verse one, chapter 1, verse 1 says. It says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, what does the heavens declare about God? That God was before them, that he is greater than them, and that he is not dependent on them. In other words, God is transcendent, meaning that his exist, he exists apart from and is not subject to the limitations of his own creation. And then in Genesis chapter 1, verse 14 through 15, it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. Again, what does the heavens declare and proclaim? The heavens declare that they were created with the purpose given to them by its creator. That there is great wisdom and intentionality behind their creation. That there is a great, uh, there is a grand design in all the stars, the moon, the suns, and everything else in all of creation. And honestly, it doesn't take a scientist to see and be left in awe and wonder. This is easily observed by all of us. 
The second half of verse 4 says, In them, in the heavens, He has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom, leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs his course with joy. His rising is from the ends of the heaven, and its circuit to the end of them. The sun itself, in all its splendor, glory, and power, runs the circuit course set by God, and it does this with joy. It does so from one end of the heaven to the other, and it does this every day. Its path, its path is fixed, and it doesn't deviate from the path set by God. Think about this. If the sun was to deviate from this path, what are the conse- some of the consequences that the earth would face? You see, the, the sun gives light, and it is through sunlight that plants grow. Without, without plants, we would have no food, animals would have no food, and we would have no oxygen. And without its heat, we would all freeze to death. And so as the sun runs its course and fulfills its purpose with joy, it declares the wisdom and power of God, not only in creating its sun and the sun, but in setting its course. And again, as we observe the heavens, we observe a divine order and great purpose in all of creation, which speaks of an even greater creator. Look again at verse 2. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor other words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and the words to the end of the world. Now, I recognize that depending on your translation, there might be some variations on the words that are used, but the basic point remains the same, and that is that creation is speaking with a language, a language that goes beyond mere words, and a language that is easily understood by all of creation. Every day speaks of a glorious creator who in wisdom laid down the foundation of the world and in power created all things. And again, their voice is not with mere words, but in the functional order of things which is observed through creation. In the most remote places around the world, one is able to look up and see God's glory in full display. This is why it's called God's general revelation. It's general in the sense that it's easily observed throughout all of creation by all of mankind. Now, we have all probably heard the saying, actions speak louder than words. Well, that that expression has never been more truer than in all of creation. Look at what Scripture describes creation as doing. In verse 1, it declares and proclaims. In verse 2, it pours out speech and reveals knowledge. In verse 3, its words goes out to the ends of the world. And again, how does it do all of this? And its joyful fulfillment of its purpose based on its creator's design. Psalm 14, verse 1 says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Truly, it is the fool who can look at all of creation and see how complex, how structured, and how beautiful it is see that there is great order and purpose and logic, and still say in his heart, there is no God. You see, it's not because of lack of evidence that they say this, because the evidence is actually overwhelming. But on the contrary, the fool claims there is no God because they suppress the truth. They, they suppress the evidence that is clearly perceived in all of creation. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20 says this, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is made plain to them, for God has shown it to them. Because God has shown it to them, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. And now here's the judgment. So they are without excuse. They they are without excuse. The fool, by rejecting God's general revelation about himself, as creation is declaring God's glory, brings condemnation upon himself. And so we see creation fulfilling its purpose and design with joy as it declares the glory of God. And I I really hope that you can see that. 
I hope that as you look at God's creation, you're able to see God's glory, that you're able to see his beauty, that you're able to see his fingerprints everywhere. And as we move now from creation to glory, we now turn to God's purpose and design in the scriptures. In section two, we find that God's words transforms us to fulfill our purpose. God's word transforms us to fulfill our purpose. If mankind is to fulfill the purpose in glorifying God, we realize that we're going to need help. As we look at creation and observe its purpose, its logic, its order, its great design, we're able to see and glean some basic truths about God. But these truths are insufficient to tell us specifics about who God is, what he has done, and what he requires of us. You see, creation points us to God. It points us to a creator, but it it doesn't tell us enough to bring us to saving faith in that creator. So whereas creation points us, um, I mean, whereas creation has enough basic or general information about God to condemn us, scripture has enough specific or special revelation of God to save us. And so God goes one step further from creation. He he gives us his word, his scripture, that in order that through it, we might come to know, love, and rejoice in God. And in doing that, we might be able to fulfill the purpose and design for which we were created for, which again is to glorify God. Now look with me at verses 7 through 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings from the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Two weeks ago, as Eli was preaching through Psalm 1, he made mention that the law, or the Torah, refers to instructions. To, and these are specific instructions given to us by the Lord. And, and it is interesting that, that in the verses 1 through 6 of our passage, creation is speaking, it's declaring God's glory, but it's doing it without words. And in our verses 7 through 11, we see the Lord speaking through his words in the scriptures. In verse 7, look how many times the Lord is mentioned. In verse 7, the law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord. In verse 8, the precepts of the Lord, the commandment of the Lord. In verse 9, the fear of the Lord and the rules of the Lord. Six times in three verses, the Lord is mentioned. It's as if the psalmist is saying, hey, listen up. It's God himself who is speaking to you. When I graduated high school, I went straight into the Marine Corps. And in the Marine Corps, during boot camp, there was this ditty that the drill instructors would yell. They would yell, ears. And we would yell, open, sir. And we would yell, eyes. And, we, and he would yell, eyes. And we would yell, click, sir. The, the point of this ditty or saying was that no matter what we were doing, And no matter what was going on around us, the second that he yelled ears and eyes, we were to focus our attention on him. And that is what the psalmist is doing here. He's trying to grab our attention so that we can focus on who is speaking and what he is saying. And not only is the Lord mentioned six times in three verses, but look at the six statements made about the word of the Lord in just three verses. Again, in verse 7, It's perfect and sure. In verse 8, they are right and pure. In verse 9, it is clean and true and righteous. These are six different ways in which the Lord speaks about Scripture's purpose and function. Verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. When the Scripture speaks about being perfect, it is speaking about being whole, complete, entire. Everything that God wants us to know regardless, regarding holiness, righteous living, pleasing God, 
and salvation are found right here in the scriptures. There's no need to look outside of the scriptures to find out who God is, what he has done, what he requires of us, or what his will might be. It's all found within his words, his instructions. And so we see here that the law doesn't just refer to the to the law of Moses, to the Ten Commandments, but, but the law, the instruction of the Lord refers to all of Scripture. The law of the Lord is complete, and it instructs us how we are to live and to please God. And here is the effect that that truth has on our lives. It, it revives the soul. You see, man has been stained by sin and separated from God. And it is in the Scriptures that we find the gospel By which we are saved. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for all who believe. As we are confronted in Scripture with our true condition, we come to realize that we are separated from God and that we are in desperate need of a Savior. And as we continue to read, we learn that God Himself has made a way through His Son. And we begin to see and experience God's love for us. And as we believe this message by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are revived. We we are restored. Another way of saying this is, is we are converted. We are regenerated, born again. All of these are, are, the, are, are different ways of saying the same thing. We are transformed. Again, verse 7 says, testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Now, there is great comfort in knowing that God's words are sure, they are decided, and they are settled. They are trustworthy and never changing. As the scripture speaks about the world, we can be confident that it is exactly as it says it is. Scripture has many things to say about creation, gender, marriage, family, work, and a whole host of other things. And as one is converted and starts seeking truth found in Scripture, he now begins to find answers that deal with truth and life. I mean, in an ever-changing tide of opinions and relativity, one is able to find sure footing in the truths of Scripture. And so the Scriptures are able to make one wise. And it is interesting that in contrast to the world, The scripture teaches that God uses the simple to shame the proud. I mean, we have answers that the world does not. Sure answers, eternal answers that are for all generations throughout all times. We have answers that are founded not in our own wisdom or understanding, but on the truthfulness, reliability, surety, and perfect wisdom of God. I mean, that's amazing. Look at verse 8. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Here the scripture points us in the way of righteousness. It helps us discern between right and wrong, what is pleasing to the Lord and what is offensive to him. It's like a signpost on a trail that has many different paths. Without its guidance, we wouldn't know where to go or what we're to do. It is through the working power of the Holy Spirit in us, through this path of righteousness, that we're able to rejoice in the Lord and that our hearts are sealed with the love of God. It is like the psalmist in Psalm 1 that says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. And all that he does, he prospers. Why does he prosper? Because his delight is in the law of the Lord. He rejoices in the Lord. It it is not a burden to him. It It is not even restricted to him. If anything, it helps him fulfill his purpose in serving and glorifying the Lord. He he is free to do as God has called them, called him. As we mentioned two weeks ago. To prosper here has nothing to do with financial wealth or health or material things in this world. To prosper here means to fulfill the purpose of one's life, which as has been said, is to glorify God. 
And then verse 8 says, the command of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Now, sin has a way of keeping us blind by making truth hard to see. But the word of the Lord is pure. It is unblemished. It is, it is undefiled. Because of its purity, it enlightens our eyes. It, it is able to remove the veil that has plagued us our whole lives so that we can see clearly. As we walk according to the commands of the Lord, we begin to grow in discernment. And we're no longer easily deceived or tossed to and fro. And in fact, we're, able to make, we're made aware of the devil's wiles and tricks. As the world calls bad good and good bad. But in the commands of the Lord, we find clarity and guidance. Our eyes of op- are open to God's truth in the scripture. And then we orient our lives based on those truths. I mean, the, God, the, the law of the Lord is perfect. And then in verse 9, the fear of the Lord is clean and enduring forever. As the mind has been renewed by the law and the heart has, re- has rejoiced in the precepts of the Lord and the eyes have been opened by the commands of the Lord, now the man is able to do response in the appropriate fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is what leads to worship of God. It has to do with reverence and awe. It recognizes that we are to be in submission to God where at one point in our lives, the world revolved around us. It no longer does. Our desire now is to fulfill God's will. And so it is clean. The fear of the Lord is actually grounded in love, admiration, and worship of God. The fear of the Lord is never grounded in God's wrath or ill will towards us, and thus it endures forever. Well, think about this. Once we take our last breath here on earth, we will continue to worship the Lord throughout all eternity, but it will be undefiled. It will be unstained with sin. It will be perfectly and completely clean. Again, verse 9, the rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Everything that the Lord has said and decreed is true and righteous. The entirety of Scripture must be taken as a whole. You can't just pick and choose what verses suits your needs. They are meant to be taken as a whole. They are meant to be obeyed as a whole. The man who has been converted by the truths of God found in Scripture and by the power of the Holy Spirit looks at the entirety of Scripture and rejoices in all parts of it, knowing that it was God who revealed these truths. His life is now surrendered to God in love and obedience to God's Word. And so as David meditates on these truths of Scripture and its transforming power in his life, he comes to an important conclusion. Look at verse 10 and 11. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. He realizes there is no amount of wealth or pleasure that even comes close to God's word. There's nothing that he wouldn't be willing to give up in order to have its power, its transforming power in his own life. He sees its benefits. He sees its goodness. He sees his beauty, its beauty, and he desires all of it above all. He sees that it is through the scriptures that he is warned and made aware of sin. And it is through the transforming power of scripture that he's able to fulfill the purpose which he was created. Once again, to glorify God. Listen to what 2 Timothy chapter 3, 3 verse 16 through 17 says. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Again, in his mind, there's nothing more valuable than scripture as it leads, guides, and restores us to a right relationship with God. And so we see 
that through the transforming power of Scripture, mankind is able to fulfill its purpose. As David rejoices in these truths and the transforming power of Scripture, he begins to recognize something that is true about himself, but also true of every one of us here. And and, and that is our bent or our inclination towards sin. But again, his longing and his desire is to glorify God. And so now as we move from Scripture, we move to section 3 in our passage where we see that we must long to fulfill God's purpose in our own lives. Look with me at verses 12 through 14. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. As David turns to Scripture, he holds it as a mirror to his life. He desires that it would have its full effect on him, and he recognizes his propensity to sin. And he desires God's help in restraining that sin, that he might be blameless and innocent of great transgression. You see, one of the great works of Scripture is that it exposes those sins that are hidden in the deepest recesses of our hearts, But here's the good news. It not only exposes sin, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, it allows us to deal with those sins. And as we see that sin is a reality in our life, we find that God has dealt with our sins by laying the just punishments of our sin on his son. Listen to what scripture says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. Again, as we learn to treasure the scriptures in our hearts, we begin to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Psalm Psalm chapter 119, verse 11, it says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You see, the scriptures are more than just words. They are more than just good advice or good instructions. They are the very words of God to his people. And one of the reasons that I would argue that people don't read their Bible, don't read the scripture, is because they don't fully understand how God uses scriptures to transform our lives. The the scriptures aren't just optional for us. They're not supplementary. They are a necessary means of grace for our daily lives. Look with me again at verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. As creation declares the glory of God, we realize that we were created to do the same thing. We are meant to glorify God and declare to the world who he is and all that he has done. With our minds renewed through scripture and our hearts transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can now joyfully fulfill the purpose that we were created for. Again, we were created to glorify God, and that is our great purpose in life. So I ask you, have you experienced this transforming power in your own life? Do do you treasure God's words in your own heart? Do you believe when Jesus says that the words that I have spoken are life and spirit? If you have not experienced this, then I would ask you, I would plead with you to ask God to make this true for you, to, me- to make this the desire of your heart, that the Spirit would illuminate these truths of his word to you, and that by them you would be transformed. God's desire is that you would come to know him through his word, and in knowing him, that you would come to love and delight in him. That's God's desire for you. That leads to you declaring God's glory and fulfilling your purpose. If you're not sure how to do this or where to begin, I'm sure there's many people in this church who would be more than happy to sit with you and talk about this. And if you have experienced this in your life, and if you have been transformed by the power of God's word, then I would encourage you 
to live out in the here and now what you will be doing throughout all eternity. That is to declare the good news of the glory of God everywhere you go and in everything that you do. And as David prayed, may it be the prayer of your own heart. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's pray. Lord God, you have designed us with great purpose. And we thank you for the transforming power of your word and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives as we seek to glorify you. God, you know our frame. You know that we are weak and that we need your help, Lord. And our desire is to glorify you. We thank you that you will accomplish your work in our lives, that you have not left us alone. We thank you, we love you, and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.